If you're planning on buying a Mercedes-Benz, today I'm gonna show you a few things you should know before you buy one. See if it was made in Germany or not. And here we go. Check it out, Stuttgart, Germany. Realize, they make cars all over the world now. And the ones that are made in Germany, they're much better than the ones made in other places. They've always made great engines in Germany. I've taken the plastic cover crap off so you can see this big V8. They've been making V8 engines for a long time and really they pretty much perfected them. This is the CLS 550. It's got over 380 horsepower but it's a normal V8 engine. There's no supercharger, turbocharger. The baby puts out the horsepower by itself, doesn't need any of those gimmicks and therefore it can last a lot longer with all that extra strain. And even though this baby's 15 years old, it's loaded with technology that you may love when you first buy it, and then end up hating when you find out how many thousands and thousands of dollars it costs to repair. As an example, here's the top of the strut. As you can see, it's got air pressure going in. It also has electricity going in it. These things are extremely complicated. When they work, sure, they ride like a dream. But on these, when they break, cars start tilting. And then, you gotta at least replace them in pairs. Now, they went on on this one when it had about 70,000 miles. Ended up costing thousands of dollars. I tried to save the customer money by replacing one, but then the car sat sideways. Had to replace them both. And then about a year later, the back ones went out. Same thing, you gotta replace them in pairs. And this, they got an airbag system too on the back. And half the car has to be taken apart to replace it. it even costs more than the front ones. Now, if you are going to buy a Mercedes, you're gonna have to find a mechanic like me to work on it because they're not easy to work on. This particular system here was a German company, Aro, but they recently got bought out by a Chinese company. So now instead of Aro, it's called an Autel IM608. And you need something at least this strong to work on the vehicle. This particular one was about $5,000. Even stuff like changing the brake pads, you're gonna need one of these to reset stuff with. You have to realize, Having these things worked on and maintained is expensive. As an example, I was recently in San Francisco and the Mercedes-Benz dealer there charges $225 per hour to work on your Mercedes. As you can see on the screen, there are millions of different things that you can check out. These are just the beginning of it. And that's just the motor section. There's all kinds of other sections and each one of them has a subsection and a subsection. To operate all this complex electronics, buttons everywhere. You really need to understand electronics. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. When somebody has to fix them as they break, they really have to know their stuff. Have scan tools and know how to work them because I met guys that said, oh yeah, I work on Mercedes. Then they get one of these fancy scan tools that they bought and they're working on a car and all of a sudden the car won't even start and they don't know what to do. They just freeze in terror. One guy I know, he had to bring it on a flatbed over here. Start it up, won't even go in gear. Then when I finally figured out how to get it in gear, use my fancy computer, car wouldn't even move, had all kinds of brake warning. And I said, what did you do to this car? And he responded, I just did a brake job on the car. I just changed the front brake pads and the sensors. He said, that's all I did. Then it wouldn't start and all this stuff came up. And he's not a liar, at least not to me. <laughs> so I figured, well, he worked on the brakes. So I got on this, went into the electronic brake system. All I did was turn off the fancy supplemental electronic braking control unit. There's a way you can turn it off. Then I started the car, turned it off, and waited 15 minutes. The computer told me that would be a good thing to do, so I listened to it. I went back into the electronic braking system, and it sat there for about five minutes. It was going 0%, 1%. When it got to 99% and 100%, take the key out and disconnect your scan tool. So I did. Then I started it up, lo and behold, it went into reverse, I drove it away, all the warning lights came on, and the brake system worked fine. And all the guy did was change brake pads. I figured somehow when he was squeezing the old pistons back in, that must have disturbed some kind of sensor. It gave a warning, and then in the dash it said, do not drive car fast, be careful. Well, that was all gone when I reset everything, and then it worked fine. You need a really good mechanic to work on these cars. You can't get them worked on at the corner gas station anymore. You can forget that. You need somebody who understands computer systems, has equipment to work on them. Just so many computer modules on these vehicles. This is an older one, but I worked on a newer one the other day. And that thing had 87 separate computer modules. 87 of them. All connected together 
with a bus line. If you ever do have a Mercedes and you get any type of a serious wreck, take the payout money. Don't attempt to fix it. In my experience, these late model Mercedes, once they get crunched in that wiring, especially the computer bus wiring gets damaged, they're almost impossible to fix correctly. Now they are smooth running, quiet cars. There's no arguing that. But like any modern car, hey, they're full of plastic crap. Look at this. The grill's cracked already. I'm sure she probably bumped into something, but still, you know, that's pretty flimsy plastic. This stuff used to be made out of metal and it was nice and solid. And I do have to say that their Bosch anti-lock brake systems are state of the art. They were the people that really started safety seriously. And a big V8 engine. Hey, they're pretty much gas hogs. This particular one's rated at 14 miles a gallon in the city. I checked it with my computer. My customer's getting about nine and a half miles a gallon in Houston. You don't buy a Mercedes Benz for gas mileage. You're gonna pay a lot for the car, you're gonna pay a lot for the fuel. And the insurance for that matter. Now I'm too much of a cheapskate to ever buy one. I work on them, I road test them, they're fun for a little while and I'm bored. So if you don't mind the price tag and the outrageously expensive repairs you're gonna get, hey, go ahead and get yourself a Mercedes. Why not to buy a Jeep Compass even though they look cool? No one has to admit they're cool looking vehicles. There's no arguing that. They got a nice look to them. Now this particular one is a 2017. So it's three years after Fiat has taken over Chrysler. And as far as I'm concerned, that's three years into the Jeeps being made cheaper and cheaper. Now, even though it's a smaller vehicle, you can see the gross weight stuff, 45, 75 pounds. They are not lightweight vehicles. But if you look under the hood, it's only got a little four cylinder engine. And you couple that with an automatic transmission, you gotta get that engine spinning pretty fast, high RPMs, before it starts getting any decent acceleration. But even though it's a small engine, you can see down here, there's not much working room. You gotta work on these things. They're still pretty hard to work on. They put it in transversely and there's not that much working room. Now this is an all wheel drive vehicle as you can see when we go under. It's got drive going to the rear and drive going to the front wheels. But as you can also see here, it's not that high above the ground. So even though it's a Jeep four wheel drive, it's not really a serious off road vehicle. It's not high up in the ground. It's more of an SUV with four wheel drive. As you can tell, it's got front doors, and back door, so it's pretty much SUV style. It has a kind of smallish, below average room in the back seat, and it's got a trunk that's a smallish size. The Toyota Matrix my wife has has got a lot more space than this trunk has, and it's got a low slung luggage carrier on the top, but it's so small, there really isn't all that much that you could hook up there. This is a high end one, so it has video display. Navigation camera, HIAD headlights, and leather seats, a Sirius radio, moonroof, and superficially it looks like a good vehicle, but it's made by Fiat Chrysler, and there's where the problem lies. If you want a long term reliable SUV, this is not the vehicle for you. Customer line that bought them invariably had problems. Some bought them new and had problems from the get-go with electronics, with transmission failure, right from brand new. Others bought them second hand and saved a whole bunch of money. There's no arguing that. I've seen people buy them when they had 25,000 miles on them and they pay well under 50% of the original sticker price, but there's a reason for that. The quality just is not there. Now even though this only has a four cylinder engine, it's still pretty much a gas hog. In town, this car gets about 18 to 19 miles a gallon because it's heavy and that's four wheel drive. But at the same time, it doesn't have that great acceleration. I've seen V6 engines that get better gas mileage than this that have much more horsepower. And let's face it, the modern Jeeps are nothing like the old Willys. These things aren't gonna last forever. You might get a Toyota Matrix that's about this size. They might last you three, 400,000 miles easy. These things, you're lucky if you ever get anything over 100,000 miles out of them. The compasses, they were basically made because they wanted to cash in on a Jeep name and make a small SUV that they can sell but that is such a cramped market with such great vehicles already there. A wise person, they'd think twice before they plop their money down for one of these things. Just understand for that price, 
you're getting a lot lower quality too. I mean, if you want to get something, you always want to have a Jeep and you're driving four or 5,000 miles a year, hey, it might last a few years. But the Fiat technology that's put into these things, not known for longevity in the least. These things, as I said, they don't have the acceleration. And this is the bigger engine. This is the 2.4. They make a two liter that's even slower. And with all the weight that it's pulling around with the four x four system, it just is not a zippy vehicle to drive around. And at the same time, it gets pretty crappy gas mileage. So you're really not getting the best of either world. It isn't particularly fast and it doesn't get good gas mileage. It kind of makes me wonder what their engineering design was behind this thing. Other than just another one of Fiat Chrysler's idea of, oh, let's make something that looks cute, see if we can rush it out and sell it to people. Now they are selling a reasonable amount. The first ones that they made, they only sold 60,000 of them, but 2018 they sold 160,000 of them. So they're banking on a Jeep name. It's paid them back some dividends. They're selling them. But really, the quality isn't there if you're looking for a long-term small SUV that you can drive without having a lot of expensive repairs as they age. And believe me, the transmission repairs on these things, they're expensive and they're also common as the vehicles get older. And when you look under the hood, you can see low quality. Look, here's the top. You can see that's all corroding. We'll go to the back. Look how all these nuts and bolts are all rusted and corroded. And that's on a vehicle that only has 30,000 miles. It could use better made metal. Could have better coatings on it. There's no arguing that. It's a big reason I'd never advise one of my customers to buy one of these if they really value their money over time. Now, when you take in consideration all the Italian designs and even actual Italian parts, that they're starting to use in these Jeeps. The quality is nothing like they were back in the 50s or 60s or even the 70s. As the saying goes, what's in the name? In this case, the name Jeep often works to sell things to people. So this thing's almost $10,000 cheaper than a Toyota. And yes, it is a cheaper made vehicle. There's no arguing that, which is one of the reasons that they can sell them. Price matters a lot. But if you're looking for long-term reliability, low cost of upkeeping it, maintaining it, I'd stay far away from this Jeep Compass. Everybody knows what I think about Audis that have been watching. But here's a really interesting story. His mechanic is a guy he went to high school with, who's a Volkswagen mechanic, of course owns Audi, they share all the technology, and he also works on the side with his own lift, his own stuff. He charges him $50 an hour in Connecticut. It's $200 an hour at the dealer. And of course, his friend is being honest with him. Get that from a dealership? Nah, maybe once in a blue moon in an Audi dealership. Beautiful looking cars, there's no arguing that. But this is pretty interesting because it's the A6, but it's TDI, it's a diesel. And he's a smart man. Did he buy this car new? No, originally these things with this option of diesel, around $72,000. Yes, I'm not making this up. 72 grand for this little car. What did he pay? He paid 26 and it had 24,000 miles on it. Now he admits, even at that price, he would have never bought this car except for his high school buddy who works on him on the side for only 50 bucks an hour and is honest. And it only had 26,000 miles on it. We're not talking all that many miles. Because here in the United States, of course, Audis are luxury cars. That kind of money for a car, it's a luxury car, right? I'll give you an example. The last quarter, Audi set a new record for they sold over half a million cars worldwide. But that quarter in the United States, they only sold 34,874 cars. Is it that Americans are wising up and the rest of the world is becoming stupid? Maybe so, but on the other hand, you gotta understand, over here, they're luxury cars. The rest of the world, they sell a lot smaller cars. It costs a lot less money. Mechanics work on them. They've used them for years. Even with my hatred of Volkswagens, I got European friends that they've been driving for decades. The people know how to work on them. The parts are cheaper in Europe. And of course, with this Audi, it is made in Germany. Read it to your heart's content. They are solid built cars. And in this case, it's a V6 diesel. They get phenomenal gas mileage. He gets 38 miles a gallon going 80 miles an hour. Watch out police. <laughs> They're designed for cruising along the highway. Now, of course, this was part of diesel gate. As you can see here, the recall's been fixed on this one. And even after that recall, because of course they were 
cheating to get better gas mileage. He went 642 miles and still had 80 miles left when he was driving to visit his girlfriend in Ohio. These things have an awful lot of range. Of course, I'm not going to argue this. They're extremely comfortable cars. You could do that without your rear end going numb. <laughs> now he bought it with 26 and he's got 61,350 miles on it. Now, he hasn't had any real problems. He had the brake pads replaced because they just flat wore out and he changes the fuel filter every 15,000 miles. Remember, this is a diesel. Diesel fuel is strange. Mold and bacteria can actually grow in the diesel. <laughs> so you got to change your filters a lot. Now he drives it every day, so it's not like it's an old boat sitting in the ocean with a diesel engine and it's going to really clog up not being used most of the time. It's used all the time, but he's religious about changing his filter. Now, of course, realize Whoever bought this car first, they lost an awful lot of money, considering that it was 72, and of course, the people that sold it to them made a profit, right? So that meant whoever owned it originally lost even more money than that. Not only does he maintain his vehicle, but having his friend, who's a mechanic, who doesn't rip him off, you really need a mechanic, or be a mechanic if you own one of these, as they age. This isn't aged yet, really, but he's smart. He's got an all-tell scan tool. He can scan all the stuff, and if he thinks there's a problem, if a light comes on, all he has to do is send that scan to his friend, and he'll say, ah, don't worry about it, I'll fix it when you get back from vacation, and he's telling the truth. Now, of course, if you had a scan tool and you didn't have a mechanic, you called the dealer, oh, they'd say, don't even drive the car, tow it to us and have us fix the car. But he doesn't have to worry about that. He's in a rather unique position here, and of course, he maintains it religiously. He watched my videos, and and he realized this has got the ZF 8-speed automatic transmission in it, and Audi told him, oh, don't worry about it, you never need to change the fluid, it's lifetime, blah, blah, blah. So, he contacted ZF, the company that manufactured him, and they suggested that he changes the fluid every 60,000 miles. <laughs> Because they want a good image. They don't want this, oh, don't worry about it, and then it breaks and you're mad. They want a good image and they'll tell you the truth. Yeah. So he's having his mechanic change it soon. That's what you do. You got to maintain these things correctly. Now, a lot of people say, oh, stinking diesels, they don't get out of their own way. Okay. This has 240 horsepower, but it has 428 pound feet of torque. That's a lot of torque. You know what torque means? You take off real fast. <laughs> and it's also turbocharged. You know, uh, the Germans have been doing diesels for years. They've even raced diesels. Don't think that their diesels don't have some oomph to them. This isn't an old Mercedes four cylinder diesel that had 98 horsepower. They've gone a long way since then. So let's take it for a spin. Now, there's no question these things are solid built. Listen to the door. Bump. And smelly rattly diesels? Well, I can't feel anything shaking on the CF transmission at idle. <laughs> Believe me, they're quiet and smooth. It's a typical ZF 8 speed. You got sport mode, manual mode. You can play to your heart's content. Here's our test road. Yeah, you know, it rides quite well. As good as you're going to ride on a bumpy road like this with tall tires. Realize if you put smaller tires, he put big ones on, it will ride a little bit smoother. Now let's see what these ponies can do. Here we go. Whoa! Hey, it threw me back in the seat. Let me tell you, these things have horsepower. So Scotty impressed? Yes, yeah, Scotty is impressed, especially that he paid a lot less for it. Realize this guy did Audi correctly with his friend. He knows Audis works at a dealership, and then works on the side on people's cars. He brought in this car, and the guy said, oh yeah, it's in excellent shape. But the main reason he got this car is because of this V6. His friend, who works at the dealership, said, whatever you do, do not buy one of those two-liter, four-cylinder, turbocharged Audis. I spend all my time working at the dealer, working on those, the ones that are in Audis, the ones that are in Volkswagens, it's the same company. Stay away. Doesn't matter what price you think you're getting, that's great. On a two-liter, four-cylinder turbo Audi, you'll regret the decision if you keep the car any length of time. I had a corporate lawyer neighbor back in Houston that had one. The transmission blew up at 35,000 miles, and he said, I can't afford this. The guy was making like 
four fifty five hundred thousand dollars a year and it just griped him that he thought he got this great german car but it was a four-cylinder turbo gasoline they are not good engines over time these diesels that's another story entirely. Sure, they cheated, but they just cheated on emissions with software. And now they've turned it back again. There's nothing wrong with these engines in terms of lifespan. And the interesting thing about this car is since they did that emissions over and they did it twice, it's got the stickers, right? The warranty goes till 2024 and it covers even the turbochargers. They got caught cheating. So that was one of the deals they did with the government. So do you have to worry about, oh man, it won't pass emissions hey even though this is a 2014 the warranty is until 2024 so if you did buy a used one like he did at a good price don't think all oh, the emissions went out it's going to cost a fortune no they covered till 2024 that was another one of the deals and you can see it got a lot of guts to it this is after they changed it so that it didn't pollute it had even more before and this is plenty enough let me tell you now as i said you got to maintain these things he changes his oil every 5,000 miles they say to change it every 10. Now it's his money and it's a wise move to change it more often but I do have to say one thing about this it is a diesel and do understand diesel fuel is actually a lubricant put some on your hand it's slimy put gasoline on no it cleans right we used to clean ties with gasoline when I was young with diesel you can actually go further on your oil changes because it's a lubricant if you get gasoline mixed with your engine oil <clears throat> You get diesel fuel, it doesn't hurt anything, it's a lubricant. So he's doing the right thing, he's changing it every five, but truthfully you could get away with 10 in a car like this. Or once a year if you don't drive very many miles, cause it is a diesel. You just have to do like he does. He changes the fuel filter every 15,000 miles. You never know what's gonna get in that, you might as well as change it. It's a simple thing, these are designed so it's not that hard to work on that aspect. They knew it was gonna be changed. It's not like some of the cars today where you gotta drop the gas tank and take it apart to change the fuel filter. They weren't that dumb when they designed this thing. Now, as per usual, it's not do-it-yourself stuff. The fuel filter is just under the passenger seat, but when you take it off and put it on, it's got air in it, and you have to have the Audi computer so you can bleed the air out of it because you would destroy the high pressure fuel pump if you don't. So you don't just go in there and put a new one started up, you'll probably destroy your high pressure fuel pump. This is why somebody like him, he's smart. His friend is only charging him 50 bucks an hour and he does it right and he's got all the equipment because he's a dealer mechanic. That's what you need if you really buy one of these and you want to take care of it. Don't think, oh, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to do everything myself. You can't. <laughs> but if you know an Audi mechanic like that, and believe me, there's an underground economy these days out there where people are like $200 an hour for working on the cars. He charges 50. Hey, there's a big underground economy and you can find people like this. Believe me, there's always people out there. So if you buy an Audi like this, make sure it's a diesel, not that four liter turbocharged gasoline engine. And if like him, you could pay about one third of the original price with only 26,000 miles on it and you have a friend who is a mechanic who's only charging you 50 bucks an hour instead of 200 then yes this could be a wise choice but there aren't that many people in that kind of a situation this may be a one-off here so we'll close the hood on this Audi and if you follow every single warning I just gave in this video maybe you can have fun buying a used Audi so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos remember to ring that bell